Hello everyone, it is Deep Dive Wednesday, which as you should know by now is the day that we delve into a story, a topic or an issue that is dominating news headlines and today we're turning the spotlight back on the novel coronavirus, which even though it has receded from centre stage of public uh, discussion, it is still very much threatening the lives of millions around the world. It continues to claim the lives of, of, of tens of thousands. Um, we have a very special guest in the house today, Dr. Christian Happy, a man who has been working on infectious diseases such as Lassa fever and Ebola for decades. The current focus of his work right now is a novel coronavirus, and he's here to tell us about the unique and, frankly speaking, underreported um, uh, contribution of African scientists at this moment in time as we try to defeat this invisible enemy. So Dr. Christian Happy is going to be here with us. You have probably seen him here before, so you know that the conversation is going to be exciting. You know it's going to generate a lot of questions. So get writing those questions, start sending them in. We have a lot to get through. Let's get started. So before we get to Dr. Happy, let me bring you a roundup of the latest uh, coronavirus and infection figures um, across Africa. Of course, we're always talking about the confirmed case numbers. Let's start with the three big numbers that you should know on this day, that there are currently 260,384 confirmed coronavirus cases in Africa. And when you look at the number of active cases, as you see on your screen there, uh, we're looking at 133,917 um, important to keep an eye on the number of deaths. Uh, we're now over 7,000 and the numbers are ticking up in terms of those who've lost the fight to uh, COVID-19 and right now we're looking at 7,049. We always want to give you a sense of what's happening in each region so let's start in the northern part of, the, uh, of Africa and Egypt is still the most impacted country there um, well out in front 47,856 cases and there have been 1,700 and 66 deaths. So next in line is Algeria with 11,268 cases and almost 800 deaths. Let's move down to Central Africa and again we are focusing on Cameroon and the situation there. Still the most impacted country in that region with 9,864 confirmed cases, 276 deaths. It's worth noting that uh, from yesterday to today, as I've looked at the numbers, the numbers in Cameroon have not shifted. So we'll see what's happening there and if there's a lag in reporting, but almost 10,000 cases in Cameroon. Next most impacted country in the region, DRC, where, as I've said to you before, they're battling not just coronavirus, but also that Ebola outbreak in the east. Uh, Nobel laureate Denny McQuaggie recently quit the COVID-19 task force, citing issues with its operation. Um, when we look at the situation in, in DRC, 5,100 confirmed cases, 115 deaths. Let's shift our attention to West Africa. We're going to be speaking to Dr. Happy shortly. He is in Nigeria. In his country, case numbers continue to go up. And you may recall that I told you that one of the major doctors' unions had gone on strike, uh, the Association of Resident Doctors that's responsible for about a third of Nigeria's doctors. Uh, they went on strike at the top of the week. Total cases in Nigeria, over 17,000 right now, 17,148 at last check. Total deaths, 455. 
in Ghana, Ghana is the second most impacted um, country in Western Africa. Uh, as you know, the president has made mask wearing mandatory. The health minister just out of hospital because he came down with with the coronavirus. Um, one of the top officials at the state insurance company has also been infected. Total cases in Ghana, 12,590. Total deaths, 66. You all know that I'm from Sierra Leone, so I'm going to check the numbers there, my home country. Numbers approaching 1,225, or rather they are at 1,225. Death 51. Eastern Africa, let's look at those numbers quickly. Sudan numbers again, we're, we're looking at Sudan with concern. Confirmed cases 7,740. So over 7,000 cases in Sudan. Number of deaths approaching 500. Kenya, again, looking at Kenya, total confirmed cases 4,044, number of deaths over 100, 107 deaths. Let's finish up in the southern half of the continent, South Africa. The numbers just continue to surge. Their peak expected in August. You may recall that a couple of weeks ago I told you that um, it was being reported in local media that they were building field hospitals to accommodate what they anticipated would be a surge in cases. Um, right now, South Africa's numbers at last check, 76,334, not just the largest um, numbers in that region, but in the continent as a whole. The number of deaths, 1,625. We're always looking at Zambia as well. A lot of countries in that region concerned about Zambia. Their cases, 1,405, 11 deaths. And Madagascar, I always keep in view, is because, you know, they did come out and say they had a tonic to, to cure this situation. Um, they currently have 1,378 cases, and their deaths are going up, currently 12 deaths registered. All right, there was a look at the, the, the full picture of the spread of coronavirus on the continent. It is worth making clear that WHO Africa is, has been saying in recent days that the rate of spread is increasing, it's accelerating. And what we're seeing um, is, is a situation where cases are moving from urban areas, big cities into rural spaces. WHO concern about the acceleration of the spread of cases in Africa. Let's talk to an expert about all of this and get some perspective on what we're looking at um, in terms of the spread, what we're looking at in terms of diagnostics and the general response to this pandemic in Africa. The um, the inequalities uh, in terms of the, the impact of this virus uh, have been felt very clearly um, here in the United States. We know that black and brown people are dying at disproportionate numbers. We know that in Africa, there's a difference in the inequality in the sense that Africa is unable or is less able to gain access to diagnostics, to the testing kits, to what we need to get a full picture of, of this virus and how it's impacting us in Africa. These inequities are being magnified. The, the inequities in the United States globally, the inequities of resources, everything is being amplified in this moment. Uh, we want to talk to a man now, Dr. Christian Happy, who is fighting to rebalance the situation. Um, he has been working very, very hard on uh, on diagnostics and how to change the, the, the field of play and to give Africa a firmer foothold in getting a sense of, of what's happening with the spread of coronavirus. He's been studying infectious diseases for, for decades, um, previously focused on things like Lassa fever and Ebola. He shifted gear to focus on coronavirus. He's the director for the Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases. And he's the Dean of the College of Postgraduate Studies at Redeemers University. He joins me now from Ibadan, Nigeria. Dr. Happy, welcome once more to the show. Thank you, Asha. Thanks for having me on the show. It's good to have you here again. Let me start by asking you how you're feeling in this moment. Like I said, you shifted your attention from um, doing this decades-long work on infectious diseases like Lassa fever and Ebola to focus on coronavirus. Um, and now we're in a time where, in, in recent weeks, the world's attention is, seems to be like drifting away from coronavirus and COVID-19, even though it still remains as deadly, as infectious as ever, but attention spans are shifting as countries open up. I, I would ask you as a scientist, for, for, for your reaction to, to how the story is playing out and the attention being given to it by 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 countries and, and by news organizations.
So well, Patrick, can you hear me? I can hear you, Aisha. Okay. So if you can hear me, what I will say is that while the attention is shifting from I mean, from coronavirus in other part of the world. I mean, Africa is basically, I mean, into it. And I, do, I believe that the story, African story should be told by Africans and not by others. And then we should remain focused. We should remain resolved. And then we should continue to fight with, with the way we started, you know, right from the beginning. It, the models actually predicted that by now in Africa, you know, bodies will be littering the streets of Africa. But it's not happening that way. Yes, the cases are going up. But at least I will say that the, the situation isn't as bad as it is. I mean, it's been described elsewhere. So the story, I mean, we should continue to remain focused and we should continue to work. I mean, African scientists are working. The doctors are working. You know, the public health system in Africa is, is, is striving. Uh, I, mean, I think Africa has learned a lot from the 2016 uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, there are modest, I mean, gains or a lot of gains that happen that the world, does, I mean, that the world that the world doesn't talk about most of the time. One of it, for instance, is the establishment of the Africa CDC. And the Africa CDC, uh, as you see on the continent, I mean, seems to be that body that is trying to coordinate the response across the continent. If you in, in 2014 we didn't have a dashboard, now we have a dashboard in Africa where we can have almost in real time the number of cases in places. And there is a strong coordination from the Africa CDC, working with the minister, ministers of health and the ministers of finance, absolutely, to coordinate these mechanisms. Then Africa scientists also are working very hard in order to address this outbreak with little or no resources. You know, and that for me, it's absolutely what I think Africa pride, as far as I'm concerned, is back. And I think we should just continue to tell our story. The story of Africa shouldn't be spoken in the lens of others, it should be spoken from, spoken from Africa within the, 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 the African context and within the lens of the continent. Mm. Um, I just want to, to, to be, be sure that everyone can hear me because I just got a message from Utibe, one of our uh, long-time viewers, who says my sound went out. So uh, just, just confirming that my audio is good. Um, I, I, I agree, Dr. Happy, that it comes down to us to tell um, Africa's story and to, to, to champion causes or, or really institutions like the Africa CDC um, that, that is doing incredible work at coordinating the response. Um, when you, you look at the, the fact that we have uh, comparatively low mortality rates um, from this, this disease, several weeks into this pandemic, are you any closer to understanding why that is? Well, I think we have several things. Oh, no, I've... It's okay. I, I, Isha, Isha, I lost you a little bit, but I, I want to believe that maybe I got your question. So the question probably was that what is responsible for the low, I mean, the slow trend and then the low mortality on the African continent? I mean, I, will, I lost your voice a little bit, but I want to believe that that's probably what you were alluding to. That was right, yes. Yeah. Apologies for that. The, the tech issues are, have started. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think, you know, we have something that demography in Africa is absolutely in favor of the continent in the sense that, you know, if you look at the population in Africa, more than 60 percent of the African population is below the age of 30. And then that is the age. And then and, and if you look at the demography, what happens in the upper part is actually a very small number. And then that's a number that is most vulnerable. The, also, the fact that, you know, if you look at what happened in the West, be it in Europe or in the U.S., you know, what they call, you know, the nursing homes are absolutely were major hotspots for the case fatality rate. We don't have that kind of system in Africa. We have a system whereby, you know, our elders are taken care of by the families. And as such, you know, the, the kind of spread that resulted in the massive casualty in the, in, in the West is a bit difficult to happen in the, in the context of Africa. I think those two things are major, you know, factors. But then in addition to that, I keep saying is the fact that, you know, in Africa, we are in what we call outbreak response mode in most of the time. In most countries in mm -hmm. Africa, they are always fighting one pandemic or another. It could be, it, it's, if it is not cholera, you hear it is yellow fever. If it's not yellow fever, it is Lassa. If it is not Lassa, it is malaria. So we are constantly, that is the health system in Africa, is constantly and perpetually in outbreak response mode. And with that, comes what I call experience. 
even without the resources, you realize that you acquire experiences and how to respond to this with your limited facilities compared to those, for instance, that, that did not have, I mean, that, that do not have access to be, uh, have the means to be dealing with these diseases all the time. Then that is, the other thing is the fact that I'll call the index of suspicion of African doctors mm -hmm. is very, very high when it comes to infectious diseases of these natures because they were trained to detect and diagnose these diseases, you know, in medical school with, uh, with, with little or no facility. So these are some of the things that, you know, that the world tend to ignore, but yet these are reality and then these are, you know, field, you know, field, you know, field stuff. So it's really not sitting in a hospital that has the most sophisticated technologies and the most sophisticated equipment. It is about being in the field, understanding, I mean, being very suspicious of a disease and taking the necessary precaution right from the beginning. So I think these are all of the things that are contributing to what you are seeing in Africa today. Hmm. Um, I just want to remind viewers, if you're just joining us, I'm speaking to Dr. Christian Happy, who's one of the scientists sitting really at the heart of efforts to scale up Africa's um, diagnostics capacity. He's long uh, studied infectious diseases like Lassa fever and Ebola, and he's now turned his attention to coronavirus and COVID-19. He's working in Ibadan, um, Nigeria. Please send your questions in. We, anything you've got on your mind regarding coronavirus, COVID-19, send in those questions and we'll put them to Dr. Happy. Um, so, um, Dr. Happy, as you were just saying that, you know, even without the, the resources, what Africa has is a certain particular skill set, a certain experience that is proving beneficial at a time like this. Um, you are in the lab, like I said, you put aside the other work you were doing to focus on coronavirus. And you you actually did the work of, of, of actually um, basically decoding or sequencing the genome. Talk to us about some of that work and what it's revealed to you uh, and what and why it's important to fight. Well, I really want to say that, you know, um, as I've always said, um, we as Africans should be the leaders in the field of infectious disease. Because I always say that the viruses are part of our biodiversity. We're supposed to be knowing these viruses better than others. And this is probably one of the ways through this COVID, how we showed that we could do it. When we got the first infection in, in Nigeria, and I got a sample in my lab, within 48 hours, we were able to decode the genetic makeup of the virus. And this, I say, is unprecedented because you know, even in other countries that were most advanced countries, they did not have, I mean, they could not do it. And by doing this, we actually lay down the foundation for developing the right and the necessary countermeasures, diagnostics, vaccines, or therapeutics. And we absolutely pursued that vehemently. And today I can tell you, Asha, with, with all pride that we have just, and we're unveiling next week, the first rapid diagnostic test made in Africa. This okay. test is absolutely shorter. 15 minutes, you get the result. And it's actually, is, is also much more cheaper than the current molecular diagnostic test that is a PCR-based test that we're all doing. That test goes for about $125. So we are changing the narrative. We are using advanced technology. We are using knowledge and we are using the skills that we have on the continent to change the narrative. For once, we are basically addressing the problem heads on from the continent and preferring solution from the continent. This test is being developed based on the genetic makeup of the viruses circulating in this environment. So mm -hmm. it's a test that will work for the viruses that we know. And what is very interesting about the test is, is a, an RNA-based test. And what we did was basically to bring in the most current what are called genomic technology, which is a gene editing that you understand all the time. Mm -hmm. So we, are, we mm -hmm. applied gene editing to, I mean, to virology. So we basically just use what we call the guide RNA to identify a section of the virus that is specific to COVID-19, then added the reporter to that and then use the molecular scissors as a way to identify that. Once the guide RNA binds to uh, the COVID-19, the molecular scissors comes in and once the molecular scissors cuts, then it emits a fluorescence, and that fluorescence is captured immediately, and then you can see exactly what it is. And 
What is interesting about this test is it's a test that is done on the paper strips, just like the pregnancy mm -hmm. test. That is mean grandma mm -hmm. in, the, in the most remote village in Africa can use it. We do not need to have highly, 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 highly technology. We are developing things that are appropriate to our own environment. We are developing things that can be deployed within Africa and things that are cheap, you know, that is I mean, and things that are affordable. So, Dr. Happy, just as I'm here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the rapid diagnostics test that the Pasteur Institute has been working on for some months now in partnership with Melogic, a company out of the UK, that test had made a lot of headlines um, in recent months. It was going to come out, out onto the market and I think it was priced at something like a dollar, if, if memory serves me right. It hasn't been yet. I, my understanding is that they're still validating it. Um, is there a difference between the test you're talking about that would be coming out of your institution and the test that um, they've been working on at Pasteur in Senegal? Yes, there is a huge difference between the two tests. The test at Pasteur Institute of Senegal may be looking at viral particles. The test that we are, we are dealing with are a test that is, very, that is mimicking the gold standard, which is a RNA-based or nucleic acid-based test. But then what we, what we are doing with our own test is that we are, we, are, we are cutting down the whole aspect of high technology and, high and expensive equipment, but turning it down to something which is like a point of care that my grandmother can use in a village to diagnose or in the, the, most, the primary health care facility in the most remote area in Africa can use. And, ex and this is what we need in order to prevent and preempt, you know, pandemics in the future. We need tools of this nature that can be deployed in the most remote areas in the world so that when information is captured, then that information can be quickly transmitted to public health authorities so that they know exactly what to do. So I think what we're basically working on and then what we've tried to do is actually to domesticate what we call, you know, uh, the gene editing technology to solve, you know, African problem. The technology or the platform that we have developed can be applied to malaria, to Lassa fever, to yellow fever, to, 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 to any infectious disease. It's all about, first of all, sequencing the genetic makeup, identify anything that is peculiar to that organism, and then within days, we can absolutely develop the diagnosis and deploy. So that is the flexibility and the agility of the technology that we've developed that actually makes this much more important. We don't have to wait for weeks. We just have to do this thing within two days, within, within days or maximum one week, we can absolutely develop a new diagnostics anytime. I mean, it's, it's absolutely exciting and, and clearly very significant that as you, as you break it down for us. How close are you to get into market though in terms of you know, mass, mass production? This is exactly the question that I raised yesterday when I was talking to the African Union, to the African Economic Commission yesterday and then to, um, uh, and, and to UNESCO. I was talking to them yesterday. I said, yes, it is the second time that this is going to happen. And I hope we don't end up the way we started the first time. The first time when my team was working in Sierra Leone and we were in the midst of, you know, a, a major problems, we sequenced the first Ebola in Sierra Leone within four months of that outbreak. We're able to develop a rapid diagnostic test, you know, in, in, I mean, with a team in Kenema. But, you know, we found ourselves in a situation whereby, you know, this whole adage that said nothing good can come from Africa. We were promoting this test and then yet the WHO, through some other people, were saying, oh, no, this test is not good. But eventually, it became, the, I mean, it became the first test to be validated for emergency use, you know, um, uh, for emergency use by the USFDA and then the same WHO that was fighting us you know, in the hospitals in Sierra Leone. But then the introduction of that test, whether people like it or not, what became a major game changer. Because within the hospitals in Sierra Leone and Liberia, that became a situation whereby the doctors could absolutely get the result in real time. And then changing, I mean, changing the situation whereby when people leave their homes without, without Ebola, with a mere fever, going to the Ebola uh, testing center, they actually contracted the disease there because they were sitting there for too long, waiting for mm -hmm. a PCR test that was taking days. And effectively, eventually, con I mean, infected themselves and they went home. So we are basically coming up with technologies that I believe are for Africa and that are easily deployable in our own context. We do not need intensive trainings to do, to, I mean, to use this test. We do not need high falutin equipment to do this test. It is on the paper strips, just like a pregnancy test, just like a malaria rapid diagnostic test. So this is something that can be moved. But then 
the innovation here is that it is based on the presence of the virus DNA or virus RNA, depending on the organism, which is very similar to the gold standard, which is a PCR. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the money that is required to move from where you are to mass production, where are you with that? How close are you to receiving um, I mean, first of all, how would it work? If I break it down for me, you've, you've come up with, with, with the test. Yeah, I'm assuming from everything you're saying, it's been validated. Is that correct, Dr. Happy? Absolutely correct. We re right now, we're about 90% sensitivity, and our specificity is about 96%. Based on okay. I mean, over hundreds of sequence, I mean, hundreds of analysis comparing this test and then the PCR-based test that is approved by WHO. The question oh. now is, can Africa own this test? Can Africa okay. ab I mean, adopt and use this test? This is, I mean, I mean, this is where my frustration lies. Because in 2014, when I developed the test, when we developed the test in Sierra Leone, nobody in Africa wanted to, I mean, took it. Eventually, we had to give it to somebody else in the US to produce it and then sell it back to us. And oh. I was raising that question to the African Union yesterday. We should put our money where our mouth is. And this is a time to invest and own this thing. We own the IP. We should be able to own the production and then sell this to the world. And, and then my, my thought, my, my thinking is going to African philanthropists. Where are they? We're calling on them to come and then use this type of solution, embrace this solution, and then let's mass produce and then share it in Africa. We don't need more than a dollar to run this, I mean, to run this test, and we can do it and, 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 spend, and, and send it across the continent and, and, then, and then save our people. Um, there's a note here, there's a comment from Abdul Rahman Lamin. I, I'll get to that in just a second, but let me ask you this very quickly. The, um, you mentioned Africa's philanthropists. I'm um, obviously here in the United States. We've seen people like Bill Gates step up and pour huge amounts of money into um, vaccine um, development. Um, it, when it comes to Africa, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily asking you to name names, but people, you can always name names on this show. Um, uh, are there conversations ongoing with, you know, Africa's, you know, billionaires? We, we have them and, 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 and those who also tag themselves as philanthropists. I mean, what's the state of conversations with people like with people like them in terms of them supporting uh, this kind of test? Uh, have, they, have they been have they been even approached? I guess is is the short question I should ask. I uh, Isha, I will say I've approached people, and you know uh, the way it is. I'm I'm a mere scientist. I've sent the ideas out there. I do hope that you know uh, people that have a, a cloud like you probably pick your phone and then call up the, one of these people. They, they will act. I've sent things out there, but I can tell you I'm not getting the kind of feedback that is deserved. Wow. I've shared the result, preliminary result, with the, the billionaires that you know, but I have not had a feedback. And I'm worried that we'll end up the way we started, because after a while, I will have no option, but we have no option but to just hand it over to a company whether in Europe or in, uh, or in, in America, I mean, America to mass produce, and we're back to square one. I think, I, I think it's a shame that we really, in Africa, love a situation where, of dependence. And I think if there's yeah. anything that we we'll learn from this outbreak is that Africa should cut down and then end its dependence because we've seen it now. We're so dependent on, on the outside that because of this lockdown, we are paying the price for it. And I think it is time yeah. to change. Let me read you Abdul Rahman Lamin's uh, comment. Um, uh, he says, uh, thank you, Dr. Happy, for situating the African epidemiological, I'll say that slowly, for situating the African epidemiological situation in context, insofar as the fight against COVID is concerned. Moving forward, though, please talk to us about how we tap into the continent's youthful population to develop and equip the next generation of scientists prepared to respond to future emergencies. Um, Abdul Rahman Lamin, thank you for that. Very much appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Happy, your response. Well, I, I mean, the, the good news about this is that we already have infrastructures in Africa. And in the past past five years, African countries have invested a lot in establishing what they call the centers of excellence. This is not spoken, I mean, this is not talked talk, talk much about by, by the West, basically because they don't want to know how much Africa is investing. The governments in Africa have taken over a billion dollars, I mean, taken over a billion, if not two or three billion from the World Bank to establish centers of excellence across the continent. And these centers of excellence are the ones 
that are actually driving the response in many of the countries that you're talking about, be it in Ghana, in Nigeria, in many other countries, those centers of excellence are driving the fight. And these are investments. These are not grants. These are loans taken by African government to build the capacity and then to, 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 and, and facilities for some of the work that we're doing. I, my facility is one of the centers of excellence, you know, that, that was funded by African government in order to do this. And it's not surprisingly, you are seeing the result. Now, in this center of excellence to answer Abdul Rahman, we have a training program to, I mean, to, 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 to train trainers that are Africans. We've trained over the past five years, hundreds of young people in Sierra Leone, Ghana, in West Africa. And now we are open and ready to train others. So, I mean, for your information, you can check, you know, um, um, maybe I should probably will share this, um, www.acegid.org. We, we have a platform where we are training people in Nigeria, where we are training young African scientists on how to develop the diagnostics, how to detect diseases. And more importantly, I will probably just, uh, we just had a new initiative and I share that today. I mean, a new initiative that was funded by philanthropists that are not African again, you can see that, mm -hmm. to preempt, to, 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 to set up what I call an early warning system to preempt pandemics. This new initiative is called Sentinel. And I'm one of the lead, I'm, I'm the leader of that initiative. But then that initiative is built on three major pillars. One is the ability to early detect, you know, pathogens, mm -hmm. known and unknown ones. The second pillar is to connect this information to public health information, I mean, to public health networks. And then thirdly, to build capacity, that is to empower young African scientists on how to use this and then let this system become part of the, 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 the public health system or the healthcare system in various countries. So we're working very closely, with Af closely in close collaboration with the Africa CDC and mm -hmm. the Nigeria CDC and the National Public Health Institute in various countries in order to start building that critical mass of well-trained young African scientists who, in the end, will be those that will be leading the fight. Overall, this program that we're actually setting up called Sentinel, it is a program that is actually meant to build the next generation of African pathogen hunters. You know, we are going to do it within the dead rose of Africa who will hunt these pathogens before they come to us. I think we, it's, it, it's long overdue. We've been playing defense, but I think it is time to now start playing offense. Yeah, uh, let me read you this 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 uh, this comment from Rosamond Conte, uh, and thank you, Rosamond, for writing in. She said these so-called billionaires in Africa are self-centered. This is the time that they should show what they can do for their continent. I, I mean, I mean, it's it's it, it's plain. It, it, there's nothing to add to that statement other than it is true. Um, the thing about this this pandemic, it, it has shown how um, we are. Um, mutually interdependent, how we are connected, how if, if anyone out there in the world has uh, COVID-19, everybody is unsafe um, and that we need to come together. And you would expect Africa's wealthy, it's Africa's wealthiest to be at the front and that that, that isn't happening. Um, I'm just wondering how disappointed you are by that. Well, I would say that I'm not totally disappointed by 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 not surprised what anyway. I'm not totally disappointed in the sense that I will say that, you know, um, I, I, when I look at the continent and I see what happens, for instance, I'm, I'm taking the case of Nigeria where I am, for instance, you could see that the private sector comes together contributing a lot of resources. I'm part of that. I'm, I'm, the, I'm an advisor of the, the, the what I call CACOVID, which is the, the private sector coalition against COVID-19. Yes, they've done a lot in the sense that they've kind of brought resources together and use the resources to provide palliative for the most underprivileged. That is mm -hmm. a positive thing, what I'm saying. But I think the most important thing is we can continue like this. We need to come up with solutions. And what are the solutions that will be everlasting? They should invest in research in terms of developing diagnostics. They should be invest, I mean, they should be, uh, they should invest in research that involves things like thera thera therapeutics, and then why not vaccines? So I think it is, the, it, it is those type of investment that will be long lasting. You could give mm -hmm. food to people every day, but the bottom line is if you do not provide them means to detect these diseases all the time, in the next, one, in the next three or, five or, ten, uh, five or six years, we may be facing another pandemic that might be 
worse than the ones that we're facing now. And we'll go back again to start business as usual. I think it's an opportunity for the African, you know, philanthropy, uh, 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 what, what I call um, the African philanthropists, to invest in this kind of development so that we can actually scale this up and own these things. And then let's, show, let's and start showing the world that, yes, we not only own these viruses, we can also turn them around and then use the viruses to provide solutions. And just so everyone is clear, what kind of price tag are we, are we looking at? I mean, how much money do you need, just for context? Um, definitely, I, will, I mean, this, this test will probably be costing us about a dollar fifty cent or two dollars maximum, right? So, and 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 as such, I, what I presented to some philanthropists was to do the first phase of it. We need one point five million dollars, but the maximum of five million dollars will actually enable us to produce. That's it. I mean, that's it. That's it. You only need about five million dollars to to get this up and running at, to get at, it at up a and scale. Running. That Yes. That's incredible. And the, a question from Andrea Kirsten Coleman. How can the diaspora help? I do believe that, you know, we we can, first of all, bring our brains together. I'm sure there are very many, many talented people in the African diaspora. We need to start thinking about crowdsourcing, looking for funding, and how do we support these kind of initiatives? And then we have, you know, figures. Our figures, people like you, actually, I keep saying it, I mean, it's always a situation where we rely on the diaspora, but I'm calling you, I rely on the diaspora. But look, let's look inward. Let's first of all look inward. I think it's, it will be more rewarding for the diaspora to see that things are happening from within. And then the diaspora can come and add to it. I mean, depending on the diaspora all, all the time, I don't think it's the way to go. We have enough resources within the continent, first of all, to even start addressing our problems before the diaspora can come and add to it. But then... If we see that the diaspora is not responding, I think we can galvanize the resources within the diaspora and say, and, 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 and say, okay, well, you got this idea, this is where you are, this is, and then let's, let's scale this up, let's produce it, and let's shame them for those that, are not, that do not want to put the resources from within the continent. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm stunned that five million is the figure that we're looking at. I expected it to be so much greater than that. And one would think that if we looked inwards, we could easily raise that. Um, Amnata Radia say, and, and thank you, Andrea, for, for, for your, your question. Thank you for that. Amnata Radia say is also writing in. Thank you, Amnata. And she says, we're sadly in the habit of waiting for someone else to take care of our problems, always waiting for aid. Even the billionaires who can make an impact are not confident in their own abilities. Um, it, it is it is it is disappointing, but we will use this platform, um, Dr. Happy, to to, to raise awareness of, of where the science stands and, and what you guys have achieved um, in terms of um, getting this test validated and what you need to move it on to the next stage. We, we will do that. I do have some ideas. Um, that, that we shall talk about. Um, as we talk about these diagnostics, um, uh, the, the diagnostics and, and the need to scale that up and get the testing done quickly, is there a certain point at which, is there, is, I guess I should rather, I should ask, is, is there a kind of, what's the timeline after all, what's the deadline by which Africa needs to have reached a certain number of tests or done a certain number of tests to, to, to really be able to gain control of this of this situation? Is there a point of no return? I do agree with you that if we continue the way we're going, we will reach a point of no return because the current, the reason why we are not testing much in Africa is because the test is expensive and we are absolutely depending on aid. We need to think about developing alternatives and go out there and test as much as possible because it's only by testing that we know, you know, those that are sick and we can isolate them and those that are not. If we don't test enough, we'll find ourselves in a situation whereby we will have so many people that are sick and we don't, have, we don't have the ability to contain them. At least the earlier we, we scale up and scale up massively testing on the continent, the better for us. And I worry that in the next, in the next six weeks, if we don't do that, then the situation will be, I mean, my spiral out of control. Six weeks, Maybe. that is not a lot of time. Maybe, I mean, that's not a lot of time. 
Um, I want to read this um, this question from Nessa Fofana, and thank you, um, Nessa, for, for writing in. She says, I've been providing psychocultural counselling for doctors and nurses at the military hospital. I am appalled at how bureaucratic processes are impeding their work. I believe the psychological well-being of our doctors and nurses is critical. We have to develop African-based therapeutic interventions to support. What's your view on the psychological well-being of our frontline workers? I mean, that is very, very critical. I can tell you that our doctors and frontline health workers in Africa are very resilient. That resilience is taken for granted by our, what I call by our government. And that's why you see today in Nigeria, you're hearing that the doctors are, I mean, the, 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 the resident doctors have gone on strike. They haven't gone mm -hmm. on strike since the beginning in February. They've been working, you know, tirelessly. But unfortunately, because when they see you making this commitment and then these things in Africa, they take it for granted. They don't sit back and they say, well, these guys are working so hard. What, what, what system can we put in place in order to help them psychologically? Because you put in so much, but you, um, you, you almost get emotionally nothing back in return. And I think, you know, as, 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 as uh, the, the listener mentioned, you know, it's very important. We need to put in place those mechanisms. People need to feel that, you know, they are working and then their work is appreciated. So these are some of the things that we need to put in place. And we should, we, I, I think... It is, it, it, it is very important. And I think, you know, I mean, as uh, we as a society, as, as, as Africa, as we know, we are a very loving society. And I, I don't know, I mean, we, we, we care, we should sure care. And I think that should be brought to the fore. You know, now that we're working, let's come together. We can't do this in isolation. People should come together and support the health, health care workers. You know, no, I mean, and support them. You know, we don't, they don't need much. It's just about just showing, showing concern, showing love, showing care, and that's what they need. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Ibrahim Lanson, I said it's that African, Africa's leaders um, cannot, it's that Africa's leaders cannot provide resources required to fight this uh, pandemic instead of waiting, I think it's a question, is it that Africa's leaders cannot um, provide resources required to fight this pandemic instead of waiting for Western aid? Um, basically just asking what's governing the actions by African leaders? Well, what I will say is um, at times I will say is lack of prior, I mean, misplacement of priorities. And prioritization becomes important. We see today, for instance, that yes, we have very good frontline health workers, resilient and hardworking. But I think responding to a pandemic of this nature requires full and total commitment from government. In many countries, you don't see, you know, the heads of the countries in the forefront. And that's not what it's supposed to be. We don't just need resources to do this, but it's about priorities. Can heads of state take the lead and be by their people every day, telling them and encouraging them? We don't see that. That is often left to one minister. But we've seen situations in the West, for instance, where the president is the one giving, you know, taking mm -hmm. charge, showing leadership, giving them, I mean, giving out the numbers and then working with this, I mean, with this council to see how they can address the nation. In many African countries, you don't see the heads of state at this moment. So, and, and I think, again, it's misprioritization. I think this is a time where we actually not just have to set our priorities, but also bring our expertise and our resources together, togetherness. You know, and one of the things that I see here is not just about the individual heads of state. They should, as the African Union, bring the resources when you don't have enough. Everybody can bring the little that they have. And that little that everybody brings will make a huge difference. Africa needs people to move around. For instance, there are, there are countries that have a lot of doctors and mm -hmm. others don't have as much. This is a time to actually share these resources so that we can support ourselves. But unfortunately, as I say, you know, Africa is one of the most, what, one of the continents where knowledge and expertise is caged. Because it's much more easier for an African expert to go from here to America and then share and give knowledge than to move from one African country to the other. And, I, and that's mm -hmm. one thing I challenged the African Union yesterday. It's not always about money. It's all about sitting down and planning and see how we can work together, share expertise, share resources. And I'm sure if we do that as a continent, we will succeed. 
Dr. Happy, we talked about diagnostics. I want to talk about therapeutics and, and ask whether um, African scientists are, are devoting significant amount of time in, in, in development of therapeutics um, to deal with COVID-19. What can you tell us about that? Uh, Isha, as, as, you, as, you, as you know, many African scientists are working hard to develop therapeutics. They are, some of them are looking into their, 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 their Africa biodiversity. They are looking into, uh, into, the, into the traditional, I mean, into, 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 into the, 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 the traditional, the, the plants. They are looking into mm -hmm. do, doing things differently. But unfortunately, I keep saying, are there resources available to accompany this process? This process takes time and resources. They are trying as individuals. Are the nations putting money forward to support this process, support them to do and then lead them to at least preclinical trial to show that it's working or at clinical trials? So these are questions that are unanswered. But again, it is a time for countries to come together and for African philanthropists, as I said, to support those various initiatives. You know, it is very possible that in, in, in the, the African pharmacopoeia, that there are probably things out there that could help solve this problem. But we need to demonstrate that by scientific evidence. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'm sure African scientists do not have the resources to get to that point where the scientific evidence can be convincing. Mm. Um, this um, comment from uh, Sophia to Tunis. Thank you, Sophia, to, for writing in. Uh, Dr. Happy, she says um, she has she she concurs with what you're saying about African leadership, and she's been saying that all along. Um, and she says, and so far, the Ghanaian president has been giving weekly updates himself, and and through their response, and though their response might not be perfect but it brings him closer to his people. Our leaders need to do better by us. I mean, Nigeria is, is a perfect example for this. I mean, there was a hashtag at one point a couple of weeks back saying, where is Buhari? I mean, it's it's a perfect example of how leaders in a moment of crisis, when they're need, needed the most and where their visibility is the most critical, how we've seen in Africa, that's actually not what, what, what has happened in many countries. I can only concur. <laughs> yeah, probably best. Um, in terms of um, in terms of vaccines and the the push uh, around the world um, to, to to get a vaccine on the market, there's a, there's there's a lot of chatter in in some pockets of the scientific community um, here in the United States that they fear um, things are moving too quickly. That things are moving too quickly and that a vaccine um, produced at this kind of speed will not, uh, it, it, that it's showing the signs of not getting robust enough testing and that that could be harmful. Um, I asked this question, A, to get your view as a scientist and, and also the concerns of a, a vaccine rush to the market, what that might mean for Africa. Yeah, I, I do agree that that could be sources of concern. But again, uh, we also need to realize that uh, uh, a difficult, I mean, I mean, special situations like this ones require special, uh, 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 require special solution. If we want to go the traditional route in terms of getting vaccines, then, you know, it might take, I mean, probably the next two to three years. Then the question is, can we leverage technologies, the technologies that are available out there to what I call accelerate, you know, vaccines? The answer is yes. I'm a member of um, the, the Scientific Advisory Board of uh, CEPI, which is a coalition for epidemic uh, preparedness and innovation. So I think that's one of the agencies that has actually funded, you know, most of the vaccines out there. But then, I mean, I, I think the idea that there are some platforms that existed that could just be leveraged to accelerate COVID vaccine production. And as such, you know, we should do that. I, I do agree that, you know, I, I mean, pushing that and accelerating it, you know, is super fast, has its own challenges. But I always say it's better to do something than to do nothing. I mean, we're better off. Now, coming back to your question, which is for Africa, you know, I absolutely agree with you because the question is, will those vaccines work in the context of Africa? It taking into account the African genetic diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Taking also into account the fact that uh, where they build or where they design, taking into account, you know, the lineages and then the genetic structure of the virus circulating in Africa. These are questions, you know, that we do not have answered. But then I don't have to, at this point, accuse the West. 
I think we as Africans have the ability to do that. We could also go on and produce our own vaccines. Today, we have the knowledge, we have the skills. We, we could absolutely go on and then say we are supporting, you know, vaccine that could be produced or that could also be accelerated within the continent. It's all about putting the resources where they're supposed to be. Yeah. That is a fact. Um, I hear what you're saying and, you know, you made the point of you've got to do something as opposed to nothing. But, you know, there are um, numerous other scientists who say we actually don't need to be so focused as a global community, i.e. the scientists can be, but as a global community, we don't necessarily have to be so focused on a vaccine. There are things we could be doing right now that we've seen have worked in places like South Korea, that have worked in, in, in New Zealand. In other words, we know how to tamp down the transmission of this virus. And it is the social distancing, it is the, the mask wearing, it's the hand washing, um, that there are things we can do to get the situation under control right now so that we shouldn't be kind of pinning everything as a be all and end all on vaccines. What's your take on that? I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I absolutely agree with those that think that way. I think there are ways to do this and to, I mean, to control it and bring it down to the, I mean, to the bearish level. You know, we've seen that in China, we've seen that in South Korea. Yes, it's back in China, but in South Korea, we've seen success stories. And I think a vaccine is not the only solution. I keep saying, you know, there are alternative solutions. I, I, I absolutely agree with that view. Mm. Um, Zaina Bangura is asking for your thoughts on the Madagascar um, potion, which I have to also add, they've been very quiet about recently. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I will say, obviously, that... Uh, it's clear to us now that that wasn't, you know, the therapy for COVID-19. Mm. What yeah. I, I mean, what, 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 I mean, initially, if you can see in your, in the last time when I was on the show, I, I, I mentioned the fact that, yes, I do agree that it might not be the most potent thing, but just wiping it, brushing it off the table without any scientific verification was the thing that I was against. I think today we have the evidence because yes, they said they were doing a clinical trial. So, and they did clinical trial and then they showed that the clinical trial, clinical trial didn't work. So, but that is exactly what science is. You develop a product, you take it down to the field and it failed. So we've seen that for vaccine developed all over the world. So which is, you know, it is a scientific experiment that probably failed and they, will, they should learn from it. Yeah, no, I get that, but hey, the reason I'm having such a visceral reaction to that is, yes, science would suggest that you do that in closed testing, um, yes. that you do it in very careful, mod um, uh, moderated, managed um, experiments, if you will, or focus groups or whatnot. Not you ship it out to like dozens of African countries and African leaders are putting up their hands saying, send me bottles of something that we don't know is it worse and could potentially harm us. You know, I am going to, because everybody who's been watching the show knows how I feel about this, fully in support of African innovation, ingenuity, and Africans taking the lead. What I am against, though, and, uh, you know, I say that unashamedly, is, is, is actions being taken that could potentially harm us. And, and right. really, in, in a way, kind of underscore this idea that our lives don't have value. I, let's just roll the dice and take a risk. That I felt really strongly about, and I felt that that was really kind of the, the subtext or the messaging that I took away from Madagascar just shipping out yeah. this potion. They wanted to help, but it's, it's a risk, and our lives matter. Our lives have value. You can't just go around taking a risk on us and saying, if it yeah. works, it works. So, you know, it's just, I found that whole episode very troubling. Um, as you look to the future right now, um, as, we, as we, we have seven minutes before we have to let you go, um, you've mentioned Sentinel and, and its importance going forward in terms of being able to, uh, an early detection center, um, an early detection system for future outbreaks. And you, you've also talked about having this rapid diagnostics test that you need to get funded. Uh, when you look at where we are with this, this virus at uh, this moment, three months in, if you will, what are the outstanding questions that you still want answered? There are many unanswered questions. And um, one,
I lost you at one. That's not a good. That's not a good. <laughs> so good. Boy, um, we seem to have lost Doctor Happy after oh, had. Can you no, hear me? Back. We can. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, you at one. Osha, can you hear? Oh, we we might have lost them again. So, answer question is, oh, God, I don't know what's going no, on with my network. You're good, you're good. You only, your network only has okay. to hold on for five more minutes. What are the outstanding All questions right. you want answered <laughs> as we look at this pandemic? I think, yeah, the outstanding questions are, why is the curve in Africa not that, you know, um, exponential? Yes, we talked about um, probably demography. But it is also very possible that the genetic diversity of African population could be responsible. That is a possibility. Could be responsible for that. And I think it's very important to investigate that because it might be possible that African, the African genomes is holding the key to some of these questions. So that is a possibility. And that is something that is a question that is yet to be answered. What is it that Africa is doing or that we are doing in Africa to actually kind of level the curve in a way that is not exponential. And these are things that we should use social sciences to mm -hmm. study and then try to understand behavior, social and behavioral sciences to study and understand. There is there are mm -hmm. just so many factors within the continent that are probably militating against. Yes, we're probably not testing as much as we can, or we, we could. But something obvious is that the number of people dying of COVID is not yeah. as high as, yeah. you know, it should have been. Otherwise, even with our diagnosis, our hospitals and the streets until we filled up with people. So there's yeah. something going on that we tend not to understand. And then we need to start looking inward and then try to identify, you know, collectively, both, you know, medical, biomedical, social, behavioral, you know, scientists, let's look inward and let's see exactly what is making us who we are and why they're making us so different from the rest of the world. Um, two quick questions I want to put to you before I let you go. One from Ariatu Kake. Thank you, Ariatu, for writing in. She says, how should we improve our medical facilities in the future when Africa still wants help and support, I guess, from, from outside? Leveraging. I will use the word leveraging. We have you know, hubs of excellence on the continent. And I think it is time to really bring that cord of Africa Union together. We as a union can address the problems. We don't need to have the same facilities everywhere. We don't need to have the same super facility. Once we have a few, let's leverage those few and use them effectively to solve our problems. You know, as I mentioned before, there are centers, poles of excellence across the continent. Let's leverage. We don't have to use the same model that says that, you know, you must have uh, 100 hospitals or, I mean, 2,000 doctors, you know, in, in a place. Let's leverage. And we, by leveraging, we should be able to, you know, bring our resources together and address our problems. You know, and then moving forward, I say, you know, if we can test the model, a model such like the Sentinel that we're talking about, that is setting up an early warning system. We definitely do not need the high falutin facilities. If you have an early warning system, then we'll be more protected. Because remember, what characterizes epidemic or outbreaks and pandemic is our inability to diagnose. If we set up a system that can enable us to diagnose early, then we can also respond much more early and nip these things in the bud. Um, Dr. Happy, thank you for answering that question. I have another question for you. A quick answer for this so we can let you go. Um, Julia Ketter wrote in. Um, thank you, Julia. Uh, Dr. Happy, she says, EDCPT contribution and grant support for medical research is of great importance. Why not form a COVID-19 consortium to get funding, going back to the rapid diagnostics test that you have created? Yes, I, I, EDTCP, I've had a grant from EDTCP before. But I think, you know, um, mind you, the grant from, those, from EDTCP has to be tied, for instance, to a European institution. So which means that you can do that. That money is tied to one European institution. And we need to think about, I'm saying, funding and having an African model of funding. 
so that we can use the resources within the continent to address these problems. So again, I'm saying, yes, while those fundings are important, Africa needs to start funding his own research in order to address this problem. And I do agree. I mean, right now, I can join an ADTP consortium because I already have a program called Sentinel. And that program, Sentinel, is about developing these tools, you know, and then connecting people together and training people in order to make Africa a better place to be. Um, Dr. Happy, I can't thank you enough for giving up so much of your time, uh, particularly in this moment when you are working around the clock to fight this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your insights and your expertise. We very much appreciate you. Uh, we hope you'll come back and speak to us again in, in the weeks to come. Um, please be safe. Um, and again, thank you for all that you're doing to, to keep us safe there on the continent and really the world as a whole. Thank you, Dr. Happy. Thank you very much, Hesha. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And we'll talk about how to find five million for you. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Take care, Dr. Happy. Um, Bye. Bye. And I want to say thank you to all of you for tuning in today. Um, I hope you got a lot out of that conversation, a lot to, to digest and process and really take stock of um, what we as Africans need to do better, what the continent needs to do better um, in this moment and for the future. Um, before I go, I do want to remind you that we have a very, very special show for you tomorrow, Thursday. This is a show that we're doing in partnership with UNHCR to mark World Refugee Day. Take a look. Hello everyone, with World Refugee Day just around the corner, we have an extra special show for you. In partnership with the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, we're shining a light on the lives of millions of people who've been forced to flee their homes. You'll hear directly from refugees from around the globe, and you'll see how their lives have been thrown into even greater chaos by the coronavirus pandemic. We're also taking a closer look at the latest data on refugee movements. Plus Plus, the inspiring story of this man, Luan Mayan, who went from being a refugee in a Ugandan camp to CEO of his own company in Washington, D.C. We've got a great lineup of guests for you. Be part of the conversation. Join us this Thursday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT. I do hope you can join us tomorrow for that very special show. Same time, same place. That was it for today. Uh, we appreciate your company and we hope to see you tomorrow. Be safe, everyone. Bye.